Take your Bible and turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 61. This will be on the heels of the Sunday school lesson this morning when we were talking about uh, watch how you dress. And the Sunday school hour on watch how you dress was, I would say, more uh, practical and um, every day for the child of God. This would be likewise, but it's leaning more towards all of the, the spiritual truth that goes along with it. It'll, it'll make sense as we get started. Isaiah chapter 61, noticing in verse 10. The Bible says in Isaiah 61, 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations." Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the good songs that have been sung and now the scripture that we have read. And dear Lord, we pray that you'll speak to our hearts through your word by your spirit and meet our needs. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and fill me with your spirit to be able to preach and teach the word of God with truth, without heresy. And dear Lord, that you would keep my mind stayed upon you and help us, dear Lord. We are totally dependent upon you, and we ask that wherever the Word of God goes forth this evening, that someone would get saved, and a saint of God would be encouraged through the preaching of the Word of God, and most of all, Christ would be high and lifted up. We commit the service unto you and ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So in this portion of scriptures and others that we will look at, we'll, we'll talk about the Christian's garments. And... Um, you see right here in Isaiah chapter 61 in verses 10 and 11, it is speaking about uh, past, he's speaking about present, and he's speaking about uh, future, he's speaking about Christ reaching all the way out into the future as far as the millennial reign, and that is obviously yet to take place. And he is speaking about uh, the past of when uh, we got saved and he hath clothed us with garments of salvation and he hath covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself uh, with her jewels. And so he's speaking about in the past when we got saved and in the present how we are to live for Christ before all of the nations. He's speaking about in the future millennial reign as the truth will spring forth uh, towards uh, all nations. 
I want you to notice this. It goes along with that portion of Scripture right there. If you look at Psalm chapter 85, Psalm chapter uh, 85, So in Isaiah chapter 61 and verses 10 and 11, he's obviously speaking about Christ and that uh, Christ has clothed us with the garments of salvation. That's the Christian's garments. And he's speaking about Christ and his work in the past, his work in the present for you and I as a child of God and uh, in the future in the millennial reign. He's speaking about Christ here in Psalm chapter 85. I want you to notice in verse 7, the Bible says, Psalm 85, verse 7, Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. And of course, it is of God's mercies that we're not destroyed. It is of God's mercy that we get saved. And um, he says, I will hear what God, the Lord, will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly speaking about uh, in this present life. You've been clothed with the garments of salvation. He's given you mercy. He will speak peace. But uh, let us not turn back again into the old life and to uh, what the Bible calls folly. Let us not turn away from the Lord. Verse 9 says, Surely His salvation is nigh them that fear Him, that glory may dwell in our land. Now watch this in verses 10 and 11. Uh, mercy and truth are met together. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The righteousness of God, the justice of God, uh, the righteousness of God demands justice. Peace with God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these have agreed and they have met and they've kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth. It's speaking about Christ when he said, If I be lifted up, and of course Christ was lifted up between heaven and earth on the cross, and righteousness, the righteousness that God, the Father, demands, righteousness shall look down from heaven. And so God the Father, looking down upon His Son as truth that sprung out of the ground when He was lifted up, was satisfied with what Christ did. And so righteousness and peace have kissed or in agreement with each other. It speaks about Christ here. It speaks about Christ in Isaiah 61.10 where He has robed us and given us the garments of salvation. And so this thought is on the Christian's garments. Uh, you and I who have been saved, you and I who have been born again. And uh, it is outward as we spoke about in the Sunday school hour this morning, but it, uh, it starts inward, of course. And the inward... Uh, reflects on that which comes out. Uh, notice this as well, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, you notice in verse 27... The Bible says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ. This is speaking about when you got saved and uh, you were placed in Christ. When you were saved and you were placed in Christ, you know that the, the next step after that you got saved was that you would submit to scriptural baptism, but it is not the baptismal waters that places you in Christ. It's the blood of Christ. It's asking Christ to come into your heart and save you in the Holy Spirit of God. He converts you. And so you are placed in Christ when you get saved. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And old things pass away. And he, the Bible says, 
have put on Christ. This is the putting on of Christ. It has to do with the same thought that we looked at in Isaiah chapter 61, 10 about the garments of salvation. And so it is you and I, born again children of God, when we got saved, we have put on Christ. And it speaks about this robe of righteousness. You and I uh, understand that uh, we are to put on clothes. And the putting on of the clothes, it covers our nakedness. The old man needs to be covered. The old man needs to be dealt with. You notice this in Ephesians and in chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 4. And in verse 22, Ephesians 4, 22, the Bible says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. The former conversation is dealing with the old life and the old lifestyle before that you got saved, that you are to put off the former conversation, talking about the old man, is talking about the old sin nature, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And uh, that's a choice that you and I have to make, that uh, we put off the old man and we ought to desire to have a righteous covering. And the Lord tells us that in verse 24, after the renewing of the Spirit in verse 23, that we would put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This is right living and the desire of being holy in our actions. And so that is desiring the right sort of clothing, not the old man not the old deeds, not the old way, that we would put that off since we have been saved and that we would put on the right kind of clothing, which is of the new man. You notice this in Revelation chapter 3. It is uh, shameful what the old man does, the old sin nature does. It is a shame, it's shameful, it's not holy, it's not godly. And uh, the Bible says that we need clothing so that uh, we're not as naked. Revelation 3, 18 uh, makes this statement to us. He says in Revelation 3, 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And so uh, we ought to be ashamed of the old man. We ought to be ashamed of the nakedness. We ought to be ashamed of what sin does and to desire this clothing that only God can provide, and that is the counsel. So we have to put on the clothes that covers our nakedness, and that clothes is the clothes of righteousness. It's a robe of righteousness. It is the garments of salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ has available. And so I ought to desire that, and I ought to put that clothing on. When you get saved, He robes you in righteousness. The, the, the old sin nature has to be dealt with. The old sin nature uh, needs to be regenerated. And so I get a new nature. I get Christ's nature. But I have that old sin nature, the old man that uh, I deal with and you deal with. It's called the flesh. And uh, it, it has to be uh, dealt with on a daily basis. And so the Lord Jesus Christ offers you and I this robe of righteousness. And so at salvation, I place my sins on Christ, so to speak. He takes my sins upon Him uh, on the cross. And then He places the robe of righteousness on me. He takes our sins and He takes them away. He buries them. The, he bears our sins in His body on the tree. So there is that great exchange. My sins on Jesus, His righteousness on me, and you as well. And so those clothes, they cover our nakedness, and our, our sin is dealt with. And so the old man needs to be covered and put on the new man. 
But as we think about this and we think about the correlation between uh, clothing, outer that we spoke about and that we understand that we speak about in the physical and we make the correlation to the spiritual as we are clothed in righteousness, a robe of righteousness, that uh, this, this clothing, it, it does not just happen. And a, a person has to make a personal choice in regards to their clothing or covering. And there are many choices that are put out there to you in your, in your clothing or your covering. In the physical sense, in the physical clothes that are worn by a Christian, they make a decision of what they're going to wear and uh, that they are going to wear it. So it, it doesn't just happen. They decide of what they're going to wear or what they're not going to wear. They make that decision. And then the spiritual clothing, it has to be decided on. It has to be decided on by each and every individual. It is available the clothing is available. Romans 10, 13 makes that very clear. For whosoever, and we sing it, whosoever meaneth me, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is available. This robing is available. Then and you and I must obtain it or procure it or accept it or take that. And it's Romans 10 and 9, 10, 13, that if, I, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so I must obtain that. And I, I say that reverently with fear that it's not just from the head, it's from the heart, though it starts in the head. It has to go down to the heart, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So the, the clothing does not just happen. An individual makes a personal choice of what they will wear, and the person makes a personal choice on their spiritual clothing as well. And then you and I must purpose that we are going to don it and then wear it. Romans chapter 6 allows us to understand about the Christian garments and about uh, being clothed in the robe of righteousness. In Romans chapter 6, the Bible says that you and I have to purpose that we will keep the clothing on. And uh, don't get ahead of me, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But Romans 6, the Bible says in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid... How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that as so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? And so there is a, another thought of this being baptized, identified, placed in Christ that we were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so they're talking about, the Lord is talking about, the Holy Spirit of God is reminding us that when you got saved, you were placed in Christ. Then when you uh, made the choice to follow through in believer's baptism, that as you went down backwards in the water, it is a picture of death rising to newness of life in Christ. It wasn't the water that saved you. It was not baptism that saved you. But it was an outward manifestation of the inward work of grace of when you got saved. And it was the first step of obedience of saying, I want to follow through with that. And then he says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall uh, be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So those who have accepted Christ as personal Lord and Savior by the grace of God are in Christ, Christ in them through the Holy Spirit of God, and the Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwelling in you will raise you up as well. Notice verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. It's talking about the old sin nature. It's been put to death with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth uh, we should not serve sin. But it is a 
purpose that I have to make. You, you have to act on that purpose. Where the Bible says that we've already read, Ephesians 4.24, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This is the putting on of the new man, putting off of the old man. It, it does not just happen. Uh, you and I are involved in this. Christ does all the saving. Praise God for that. Salvation is of the Lord. You and I made a choice and decision to accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. He then clothed us in righteousness, gave us the garments of salvation. But the Bible says that you and I should not then continue in sin. And so you and I can uh, take it off, if you will. And, and you bear with me, and I'll, I'll make it clear. You and I could lay aside the garments. has to do with choice after getting saved. Uh, each person can make a choice to keep their clothing on or take them off, physically speaking. In the spiritual sense, a person that got saved is saved. A person that accepted Christ as personal Lord and Savior from the heart is saved, is sealed until the day of redemption. But they can also choose to fall away from God. They, they can choose to fall out on God. They can choose to back up on God. They can choose to fall out of love with God. They can choose to fall out of love with the Word of God. And they can choose to back up on God. Granted that if they're saved, if they were saved, they are saved. Praise God for that. But they can choose to back up on God. It's still theirs. Uh, they can choose to be clad or not to be clad. They can choose to leave their first love and be guilty of that. They can choose, like the dog, uh, return to the vomit, and uh, they can backslide. When they backslide, they're heading towards a life of defeat and misery. Elimelech in Moab, Lot down in Sodom, and so forth. Jonah he wound up in the belly of the whale. You notice this in 1 Timothy 4.1. And I'm not preaching that a person can lose their salvation. If a person is saved, they are eternally saved. If they got saved, they are saved. But uh, there are a lot of them that are setting aside their robes of righteousness for wrong living. 1 Timothy 4.1, the Bible says... Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And so this is speaking about uh, an individual that departs from the faith, falls out on God, falls back on God. I'm talking about a saved person. I understand that there are people who made a profession of faith so-called that did not get saved in the first place. The Bible says they went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, no doubt they would have continued with us. But they went out from us, and so these are the ones that did not get saved. There are those who made a profession of faith so-called, but they did not truly come to a born-again state of accepting Christ as personal Lord and Savior in the heart. It was a mental ascent. It was simply in the head, and it did not get to the heart. And it is, is spelled out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, uh, by which you are saved uh, unless you believed in vain. And so you, you and I don't know that. You and I don't know who's saved. They can know they're saved. You can know you're saved. God knows if you're saved, and you know if you're saved by the grace of God. But you and I can't tell other people who are saved. All we can do is read the Word of God, preach the Word of God, allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to hearts. But there are people that all the time thought they made a profession of faith as a young person, 
and come to realize later in life they weren't saved. And it was only by grace that they were kept alive to where they could hear the gospel, plain presentation, accept Christ as their Savior and get saved. On the other hand, a child can be saved. Any child, suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God. A child can be saved. And so a child that uh, gets saved is saved. An adult who gets saved is saved. But that child or that adult can be seduced and drawn away from the faith. The Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, and we are in those times, some shall depart from the faith. This is a falling away of the faith. That uh, uh, children of God are departing from the faith or falling away from the faith. You could say, well, they're, they're not saved. I don't know that. You don't know that. If they were saved, they're saved now. And if they fall back on God, backslide on God, depart from the faith, then there's the promised chastening hand of God. You say, what does that look like, preacher? I don't know for that individual. I've experienced it. And so it's different from every individual of, of the manifestation of the chastening hand of God in their life. But there is a promise of that in Hebrews chapter 12. He says, but these will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Seducing you. And these seducing spirits are at work tonight. The seducing spirit means a drawing away and is meant to draw you away. Draw you away from the Bible and tell you there's something more important than reading your Bible. It could be as simple as the, the, the very sitcom that you're addicted to. Like, man, I got to get home. That, that's, that's coming on TV. I got to see what's happening on this next episode. It could be any type of thing. It can be people, places, and things that tells you this is more important than reading your Bible, and there's nothing more important than reading your Bible. Nothing. There's nothing more important than the spiritual. And he says these are seducing spirits, and you know they're at work in your life all around, and it goes to doctrines of devils. Uh, evangelist uh, Tom Souter, I was just speaking with him uh, on this matter of uh, demon possession and demon oppression and oppressing the child of God. And, and he said it is like pitching or, or picking up a hitchhiker. If you pick up a hitchhiker, you are opening the door and giving them permission to get in your vehicle. And then they're coming along for the ride. And uh, he said this is like picking up a spiritual hitchhiker. And you are opening the door for demonic influence and giving them permission to come along for the ride. And they will seduce you away from the Bible, away from God, away from church, away from prayer. And you have opened the door to give them permission. You need to shut the door. The clothing does not just happen, and you could take it off and lay it aside, but it may cost you. It may cost your family. It, it is yours. If you're saved, praise God that you're saved. If your kids are saved, praise God they're saved. But um, you and I need to be careful. There is a sin that's up to and including death for the child of God. It's 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. In 1 John chapter 5, the Bible says in verse uh, 16, 1 John 5, 16, If any man see his brother's sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. 
All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. There is a sin that is unto death. This is a crossing of the line with God. When the child of God has come to that point, now praise God they're going home, but there is a sin that is unto death. There is a repentance towards God. When an individual sees the error of their ways and repents and asks for forgiveness, 1 John 1, 9, and then they want to go God's way and they can have peace back in their heart, the garments of salvation. What you and I wear in society reflects on our being. It makes a statement. It shows what we desire. Every crowd that seems to want to be different, they have crowds that dress the same. If they're going to be goth, they, they look goth. And uh, if they want to be in, in the biker crowd, they look like they're in the biker crowd. And uh, there is dress that distinguishes them. The Christian has outward clothing that we discussed. It's 1 Timothy 2, 9. The Bible says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, gold, pearls, costly array. It just simply says that for a child of God, there is an outward clothing that should identify them as a child of God. But it starts with the inward, the Christian inward clothing and it ought to manifest itself outward. You notice this in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians and in chapter 5. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. And it has to do with the fact that you and I would promote each other and love each other to the better that the child of God wants the best for their brethren, that the child of God wants all that God has for each of you and for His church, that you don't want to see somebody's demise. You want to see all that God can do in and through them, that you pray for them, that you promote them, that you bless them, not in a false sense, but in a real sense. There's different types of clothing that has to be worn simultaneously. We won't dive into it, but Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 is speaking about putting on the whole armor of God. And so let me finish this evening quickly on these things that we are commanded to put on as the garments of a Christian. We already mentioned this, that we are to put on the new man. That's Ephesians 4.24. That you would put on the new man. That is after Christ. It's not for salvation, it is because of salvation. In Galatians 3.27, the Bible says that we are to put on Christ. What would Christ do? How would Christ react? What would Christ have me to do in this situation? And then I'll have you to notice this in Romans chapter 13. It's talking about the Christian's garments, speaking about the spiritual context, Romans chapter 13. In Romans and in chapter 13, I want you to notice this in verse 12, Romans 13 and in verse 12. The Bible likens sin into darkness and Christ into light, Christianity into light. 
the old man nature as the dark, the new man as then the light. Romans 13, 12, the Bible says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. We are to put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Notice that in verse 14, that you and I would put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. That's what you and I have to do. God's given you the robe of righteousness. God has given you the Bible. God has given you the opportunity of prayer. God has given you a local church to attend. But you have to do that. You have to put on uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about salvation. I, I'm talking about the daily clothing of the child of God. And by doing so, then you make the choice not to make the provisions for this flesh or the old flesh to fulfill the lusts. And that, that's the premise that the flesh works off of. The, the, the premise that the flesh works off of, it starts with want. And it moves into desire. And then it bases itself on feeling. And um, the Bible makes it clear. It is the, the lust of the eyes. And in the lust of the eyes, I see it. And, and people get in trouble all the time by what they see. Or who they see. And it is the lust of the eyes. I see it. And then it becomes the lust of the flesh. I want it. I see it. Then it moves into I want it. And then it goes to the pride of life. I deserve it. And the devil tells you there's only one life to live. Live it up. And it's all about you. Where Jesus says there's only one life to live and that I'm to live it for Him. It is opposite of the old man. The flesh works off this premise to fulfill the lust thereof. And so I have to cut off that thought. When that thought comes up, I have to cut off that thought so that I do not feed that process. And the process will be fulfilled if I don't cut it off. It's the flesh, and it justifies itself in saying, you deserve it. No, you have to crucify it. You are to put on the armor of God. And then notice this last, it's Colossians 3, Colossians 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 3. This lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life is age specific, but it's the same. And it works on different ages. It's the same principle. The devil uses it. But he, he, he works on every age bracket using that same principle. In Colossians chapter 3, we talked about uh, putting on. This is the Christian's garments. We talked about types of actual physical clothing this morning in Sunday school, and this is spiritual clothing, if you will, of what the Christian garment and what the Christian is to put on. 
has a lot to say about it. Colossians 3.12, the Bible says, Put on therefore as the elect of God. The elect of God is a saved person. Put on therefore as the elect of God, a saved person, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. I mentioned that I was speaking to evangelist Tom Souter, and he has dealt in, in this area extensively on uh, opening the door to the devil, demonic activity, and asking him about uh, people and activities that we see around us and how they're driven and so forth, and uh, possession versus oppression. <clears throat> possession means ownership, and a, a child of God cannot be possessed uh, by the devil. You have the Holy Spirit of God in you, but you can open the door to the hitchhiker and cause yourself a lot of difficulty in your life. And he said that, uh, you know, what you would already know, the number one way to open the door to uh, demonic activity, takeover, and, and cause you lots of difficulty in your life, can't get your soul, you're saved, is the matter of having an unforgiving spirit. And said so the devil capitalizes on that. If you will not forgive, forgive us our debts as we forgive. And he said something to the effect, the Bible does, that if you will not forgive, neither what will your father. And he said in the matter of dealing with people and counseling with this Christians, the way that most of them open up for demonic oppression, difficulty in their life is in the matter of forgiveness and won't forgive. And it's a whole other sermon and we won't take time to go there, but you understand the parable of the one that had his debt forgiven and when he had his debt forgiven, that was an insurmountable amount of debt forgiven. He went out to somebody that owed him a little and took him by the throat <clears throat> and uh, demanded it or throw him in jail. And he got back to the one that had forgiven. And he said he was evil in that thought to turn him over like the tormentors were to prison. And it is a mental prison and torment applied by the devil when an individual will not forgive. And so you see this here of putting this on in Colossians 3, 12 through 15. For our own good... He says in verse 13, forbearing one another. What is that? It's patience with each other. And forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Close the door to the hitchhiker. Don't let him in. These are the garments of the child of God, of the Christian that we are to put on. Certainly something to think about this evening. If the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you in any way, then allow the Scriptures to do what they're supposed to do and um, ask the Lord to help you with it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you, dear Lord, that a saved person cannot lose their salvation. That's the truth. 
well established in the Word of God. We thank you, dear Lord, that you have robed us in righteousness. Help us, dear Lord, to desire to wear that robe of righteousness, not lay it aside, and not to invite difficulty into our life. Help us, dear Lord, to desire to go forward, not backward. Help us, dear Lord, to follow you. And dear Lord, we ask that you would help. If there's anybody that's experiencing any difficulty, dear Lord, to give it over to you, to confess it and forsake it. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have good news to bring, and that is why I sing all my joys with you. I'll share. I'm going to take a trip on the good old gospel ship and go sailing through the air. Oh, I'm going to take a trip on the good old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. Oh, I'm going to shout and sing until the heavens ring when I'm bidding this world goodbye. Oh, I can scarcely wait. I know I'll not be late, for I'll spend my time in prayer. And when my ship comes in, I'll leave this world of sin and go sailing through the air. Oh, I'm going to take a trip in the good old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. Oh, I'm going to shout and sing until the heavens ring when I'm bidding this world goodbye. take a trip in the good old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. Oh, I'm gonna shout and sing until the heavens ring when I'm bidding this world goodbye.